What's going on, people? We are Tottenham TV back here for yet another panel show. We've got a lot of things to discuss this week. Introducing the panel, we've got returning guest Kate, just the girl who loves Spurs. How are we doing, Kate? All good, thank you. Hope everyone's well. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you as well. Um, I saw that you were on the pump up on the way up to, well, well, I was up north, but I wasn't on the way up to Newcastle, thank God. But uh, <laughs> you did a good job trying to pump people up and then just to get it thrown back in your face. Story of my life. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> um, and the next guest we've got, bam, 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 <laughs> Lord Pessy himself, Mr. Josh King. How you doing, Josh? Yeah, I'm all right. You're going to have to forgive me. My um, house is a bit of a building site at the moment. I don't know if you can see the Spider-Mans on the back of the walls and stuff, but I'm uh, kind of podcasting from my children's room at the moment. Um, but, you know, I'm as pessimistic as ever, ready to play the villain. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, let's go I we were to get slapped by Newcastle <laughs> you're, you're right yeah, the, the I can quote actually is, Josh he <laughs> says I, he, before the game he said I can't see us getting anything at Newcastle he said I yeah the only the problem game. is he says that every single game <laughs> yeah that is true <laughs> <laughs> um, alright well let's get straight into it let's talk about that Newcastle game we'll start with you Kate do you feel like that Newcastle game and the performance was um, a massive red flag uh, by the football that Ange Postecoglou is deploying at the moment do you know what? I, w I was just saying to Josh, I think the the um, reaction to that defeat was, well, it has been absolutely monumental. There's been the, an, an enormous meltdown within the fan base. Um, it was a terrible defeat, don't get me wrong. I thought we was all fall all over the pitch. But I think it's a case of, we know, you know, I, I've seen debate after debate of people saying, Ange has got to change, he's naive, he's this, he's that, the other. We know what we're getting with Ange Postecoglou. He's made it clear everywhere he's ever been that this is how he plays and this is how he's always going to play. For me, it's not a red flag in the in the sense that I don't trust the manager, but it just highlights to me that we don't have the personnel that can play well enough to to do his system the way it needs to be played. You know, we've got so many players that don't fit, and until the summer comes. Nothing, in my opinion, is going to change. I don't think Angel will change his system between now and the summer. So, yeah, we may get a few more drummings along the way. But I kind of respect the fact that he's instilling this philosophy. Um, I think changing it for the sake of a few months, I don't really see the point, you know. Not everyone keeps telling me they don't care about top four. So I say, you know, go, go with it and let's wait and see. When he gets the personnel, assuming he gets the personnel he wants, let's see where we go from there. I'm not judging him on this season. I'm judging him on next season. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a good attitude to have, to be fair, and I'm kind of like the same. Uh, but Josh, do you feel that that was a red flag from what you saw at Newcastle? Um, it's, it's hard to say. So, like, not a red flag on Ange. I'm okay, totally okay with Ange. Um, and I'm hoping that just very similar to Kate that like it's the first season it's just kind of growing pains when you compare him to all the other big managers that did well they all had results like this in their first season mm. um the only like kind of amber flag is like you know he he does need to make some adjustments sometimes well do you know what would be a really good barometer we can find out in this next game against Arsenal we've got two weeks off I don't mean to divert subject or whatever, but like, okay, you have that result. So, you know, that's a bad result against Newcastle. We've now got two weeks off. Does he do something special for Arsenal? Because you've got all this time on the training uh, ground. You can implement tactics that work specifically for Arsenal. I think to be a, a, a manager that wins things, Klopp and uh, Pep, even though they have their philosophies, they do change things sometimes. So I do want to see some sort of adaptability. Some, I'm not saying I want us to start playing low block football or anything like that, but can we pinpoint something in this next game where he's taken the time, he's used the advantage of two weeks to do something specifically to break Arteta? Um, that's the only amber flag I have. Not It's not a red flag because it's the first season, but I do want to start seeing as we progress now and go into next season i want to see him change things little tweaks on things to suit the um you know opposition 
Uh, I get your point, but you know, you, maybe Arteta is a bit of an exception to the rule, but you look at Pep Guardiola, you look at Jurgen Klopp and what they brought when they first came to Man City and Liverpool. I mean, I know later on they, they started to change up their style a little bit um, for specific games, but they didn't do that at the beginning. Maybe it was just to try and instill that kind of way he yeah. wants the team to play on a consistent basis. So do you not think that Ange should be following that same suit or do you still think that maybe... Yeah, in this game particularly, we need, we do need to change it up. But then again, you look back at the performance at the Emirates, we didn't change it up for no one and we probably should have won that game. Yeah, yeah. Um, what I will say to that is, like, you know, I was listening to your stats show the other day, uh, or it was yesterday actually, wasn't it? It was a mm -hmm. really, really good show, by the way. Um, and when we look at those first 10 games, just like you guys were saying, People didn't know what to expect. Do you know what I mean? I, I think Arteta's going to have a better idea of, of what to expect. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is like, we haven't got a cup final this this season. We haven't got a semi-final where, where I, I would want Ange to make some changes. Let's treat this Arsenal game because it's a, it's a like double whammy. We can, um, you know, if Villa pick up a poor result, then it puts us right back in for top four if we beat Arsenal. But also we get to stop Arsenal winning the league. If we beat them, that's it done for me. Yeah. So let's treat it like a cup final and and do something like as if it was a semi-final or it was a final because they do make changes for, for important games, Pep and, and Klopp. And you're right, it's the first season, but it's an important game and you can go back to whatever you want to do afterwards if you just want to play the same way out. But, but this game is very important for me. So, um, yeah. Yeah, Sim, as a, as a heavily backer of Ange Postecoglou, mm. like I think all of us are, to be fair. Have you seen some red flags? I think the, ma the major concern is that it that kind of performance literally happened a couple of weeks ago at Fulham. That is the big concern. And then very quickly it happened again at Newcastle's really similar performance. Um, the fact that we were so vulnerable um, in the transition, how easy it was for the opposition to get into our box and create chances and create um, good opportunities from transition. And then on top of that, how easy it was for the opposition to create chances from set pieces as well. After that happened at Fulham, you would have thought, okay, learn a few lessons from that make i don't know about make a few adjustments but understand why it went wrong at fulham and try and you know learn from that game and it seems like we didn't really learn from that game and that's the biggest concern that it happened so quickly um after that game so Obviously, as well, you couple into the fact Newcastle were really depleted going into this game, missing a lot of defenders, a lot of midfielders. Uh, you would have looked at that um, Newcastle lineup, and yes, they had a very good front three out, but you would have looked at that um, defensive midfield and think, we have, we, we should be able to get out of that defence. We should be able to win the midfield battle, and we weren't able to do either of those things. Um, and obviously, knowing our fixture list going forward, I know going to St. James is never an easy game. Even when they got a depleted team, it's never an easy game. But with the top three coming up, it was a very big opportunity for us to get some points on the board with it in, in that top four race and make sure that we put ourselves in a good position. So the fact we not only lost the game, we not only um, didn't take advantage of Newcastle being depleted, but we got absolutely trounced. We got bad 4-0. It could have been even worse. <laughs> um, we... Every set piece looked like it was going to be a good chance for Newcastle. We couldn't, not only did we get trounced, we didn't even create a good opportunity apart from a couple of chances for Werner in the opening 15 minutes. And so you, you take all that into account and you take into account it was a very similar performance against Fulham. And then you take into account... Um, how open we looked when there's been a lot of excuses being made for <laughs> why in certain games we've looked open or not. And a lot of excuses about we don't have this player in midfield, we don't have, you know, these players injured in the defence. But then you look at the midfield uh, against Newcastle, Basuma, Bentenko both playing. We've got our first choice back five playing and we still looked so vulnerable. And not only just vulnerable, like second best in every department, that is a major, major concern for me, the fact that that happened against Fulham and then it's happened again and we don't really have any excuses. Obviously, I'm willing to give it time. Obviously, I'm not sitting here saying I'm worried about Andrew's future or anything. I still believe in him and I still believe it, it will be a time thing. I believe win time, with um, these things hopefully will change. But that was definitely a, um, a big concern about what, what happened on Saturday, how 
um, tactically, we just got completely done. Now, to be fair to Eddie Howe, he clearly made adjustments to how he usually plays. He played a back five, um, which Newcastle don't usually play. I was listening to a um, Newcastle fan. I was reading their comments uh, on our video, and he said, it's only the second time this whole season Newcastle have made a tactical adjustment for their opposition, and the only other time was Man City. And they nearly won that game against Man City, I think. De Bruyne came on late and saved the game for them. So they very nearly beat them as well. So Eddie Howe's a clever manager. Um, I have to, you have to give him credit. They came up with a tactical system. We had no answer. But the fact that we had no answer with a fully fit squad up against a completely depleted Newcastle team is a bit of a concern um, for me personally. So I hope we learn those lessons. But the problem is I said that against Fulham and we didn't learn the lessons. So that's kind of... I'm not saying one strike, but it's... I don't know how to I don't know how to articulate it, but the fact that I wanted him to learn the lessons from Fuller game and they didn't, right? That's kind of like okay, well that's one mark against you then, because you, you didn't learn the lessons that time. And I'm willing to give him a few more marks, but that is one mark against him after that game. Ben, yeah, but you... ben, I've broken, I've broken Sim. I know. I can't, Sim's I can't, more can't... Range out than you, Josh. What's going yeah. on? <laughs> no, I know, but I agree with everything all you're saying. I agree with what Josh said. These results will happen in the first game of the se- in the first season under a new manager. Of course, I understand that, but. Will it happen so quickly one after the other like that? I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit a bit concerned that we'd like it was exactly the same performance as Fulham. But you know, like exactly we, the we same. All, we all came into this season being like the season's a bit of a free hit. If we get Europa League, it's going to be a good season. Um, and then obviously the ten, the first ten games happened, and I think it all lulled us into a bit of a full sense of security of where Spurs Not are me. actually at. Not me. <laughs> apart I'm from you, George. You. Apart from you. <laughs> um, but it, it lulled most of us into a full sense of security, right? Being like thinking that we're actually better than we are, and even then though we were saying there's going to be a lot of ups there's going to be a lot of downs this season and when these downs happen throughout this season people just throw their toys out the pram and I think it's just a bit unwarranted and we didn't we weren't able to have those downs with our first choice 11 in the first 10 games because we were so good and then we had all those injuries all those suspensions and we've only seen this first choice 11 come back very recently so maybe this is the now we're seeing these kind of dips that we're having with the first 11 and Ange needs to see the, this happen on a consistent basis so he knows how to um, change things and progress things going forward and see what kind of players he needs to buy in the summer. Yeah. So for me, it's not a red flag. For me, it's just part of the progression and part of how Ange can move forward. Um, so, yeah, obviously I was devastated with the performance and the result against Newcastle, as I was against Fulham, as I was against Brighton and the other losses that we have this season. But I'm not too worried about it. Like... I'm not too worried about top four or not. I'm really not. My my biggest concern from now to the end of the season is stopping Arsenal win the league. I don't really care <laughs> about top four. So um, that's where I'm at with it. So, But let, let, let me put this question to anyone in the panel or whoever. We have our first choice back five um, yesterday uh, on the weekend. We had Basuma and Bentancourt playing in midfield. Like... What was the problem then? Was it a case of would, um, was it a personnel issue? Why we why the performance happened like it did on Saturday? Was it just a time issue with Ange's system getting used to his system? What do we what do we think the problem was? Our attackers, I think. I'll let Kate go. You go. No, go on. You're, you're fine. Go on. You yeah. started so um, you can finish. <laughs> yeah, no. Just just basically our just just our attackers like. You know, Werner had, was it two chances Werner had? Yeah. 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 Well, three, we, technically. This, this, what did you say? Three? Well, kind of, because he had one that hit Son, didn't he? Like, he had a shot that hit oh, Son. Yeah. He had that volley, went over the bar, and then he had that one that Madison cut back, and he just went near the corner flag. I've, I've, I don't even want him as a squad player. I'm sorry. I don't care what anyone says. Like, I'm not saying he's a bad player. I'm not saying he hasn't done some good things for us. But let's not, let's remember what we wanted him to come in as, which was Son's at the Asia Games or whatever it is, and he's coming in to fill the void. He, he, you know, none of us expected Werner to light the world on fire or anything like that. So just because he's he's laid on a few assists and scored the odd goal, that hasn't really been important goals, to be honest. It's usually when we're like 2-0 up or whatever. Um, let's not continue with this type of attacker, which that can't hold on to the ball. Like, think about it. You've got Son, Johnson and Werner who all attack space. They are great in low... They'd be great under Conte when you, you're sitting back and they can bomb on, yeah? Who are our 
attackers that can actually hold the ball and play clever passes and do short, quick runs and play off each other. Who plays off <coughs> Madison? Like earlier in the season, Madison and Son had a really good partnership, but that was because teams were giving us space. Arsenal, like when you think about the Arsenal Liverpool games, the even even Bournemouth were trying to press us off the park uh, and stuff like that. And Burnley, do you remember? Like mm -hmm. so, in when we've got low block um, opposition like Newcastle were, I wouldn't call them fully low block, but they were all good. It, when they didn't have the ball, they were they were playing like a bottom half team basically. Um, you have to have players that can do something else that speed isn't their only attribute. I, I wouldn't mind if Werner could actually hit the target most of the time, but he can't. So, yeah, I think it's our, our attackers not being able to hold onto the ball and finish their dinner. Yeah, I mean, Timo Werner is such a conflicting one throughout the fan base, isn't it? I mean, I think it's like split down the middle, half saying we should keep, half saying we should get rid. I mean, there's even campaigns uh, online uh, for and against uh, Timo Werner, which I think <laughs> is just nuts to me. But I, I, I look at Timo Werner and I'm thinking like, he can't be our out and out first choice left winger, no chance. But if mm. we can bring someone else in, we're not going to be able to sign six or seven world-class players this window. It's just never going to happen. So as fillers in the squad, Timo Werner for 15 million, plus a Nico Williams or someone that can really uh, lead the line for us on that left-hand side and be that kind of player that you want him to be. I think Timo Werner coming in as an option late in games, I think it would be brilliant. Yeah, I mean... For jo I agree with what Josh said to an extent. I think, for me, we Van der Ven had an absolute nightmare. That's one of the things that went wrong. And he's been sort of our star signing, really. And then I just think our midfield is shocking at the minute. For me, Basuma's not good enough um, to be a midfield general. Now, I know the first 10 games, yeah, he was brilliant. But that means nothing to me when you're good for a third of the season and crap for two thirds of it. I would like to see a Zuba Mendy, someone like that, come in, who's strong as a defensive midfielder but that can push forward. Um, because for me, when Basuma drops off, Matters drops off. It seems that they bounce off each other. And Basuma, for me, hasn't got that leadership in the midfield. I think Timo gets a hell of a lot of hate. And I think the fan base on the Timo outside have used this game as another stick to beat him with. Um, as another scapegoat. Um, he was never going to be a prolific goal scorer. Anyone who thought that was out of their mind. Um, he was a stopgap player. Um, I personally think we're signing him. I was all for signing him now. I'm kind of mm, not sure. But for 12, 15 million, it's, what are you going to get for that? As a squad player, um, as you say, he's never going to be the first choice. But he's got experience. He, he's won where he's been, you know. And I think a lot of the trouble at Tottenham is the mentality of the players. But, you know, we, we need to win something. I know it, it sounds such an obvious thing to say, but winning breeds winning. And that mentality of crossing that first line of winning something is what, what's needed desperately at Spurs. And I think people like Romero who have won things, uh, Timo, are going to be only good for the dressing room. So, for me, it was a combination of the midfield and the attack. But I think everybody on the day was rubbish. There was not even a single player that sort of shrouded himself in any sort of glory. Everybody was poor. Um, and I don't know, if, don't think you can blame Ange Postacoglu for that. Yeah, I, I think that's spot on. And I hate this kind of piling on when... It's one player when it's clearly one to 11. Every single player on that football pitch was just goddamn awful. So yeah. you can single out Timo Werner because he's the one uh, that missed those chances. But you got to single out every single player on that pitch because no one was up to scratch that day. So I think the, the kind of scapegoating of Timo Werner is a bit unfair um, after that Newcastle game. But uh, Kate, you talked about that midfield and it brings us nicely on to the next topic, which is what is wrong with our midfield? I think you've given us a bit of an insight already to what is wrong with the midfield. So uh, we'll go into Josh, like from your opinion, um, you know, you look at Basuma, you look at Madison, you look at even last game against Nottingham Forest, we had to take off two midfielders and bring on, um, you know, Ben Tancor in the second half when Saar wasn't really up to scratch. Basuma he seems had to, to change off. every game, doesn't he? Yeah, he doesn't seem to it is. The, the midfield does seem to change every game, but you look back at the first 10 games, we had that starting midfield of Pupsar, Basuma and Madison, and they were just running midfields every single week. What has happened and what is the answer? Um... 
I do think he needs to give that a try a bit more, like just go in Saar, Basuma, Madison, because I feel like he ha he hasn't done... He keeps um, trying to shoehorn in Bentoncourt, and I know we all love Bentoncourt, but I don't think he... I still don't think he's at the levels that he was before, and it might not come until, like, next season. Do you know what I mean? But do you not think he's um, performing better than Basuma at the moment? It's a weird one, because one week I will think he is, and then the next week I won't, because... He's losing the ball just as much, but I, yeah, it's basically the long story short is I don't know fully what's wrong with our midfield, but I do know what it's what I think it's missing, which is basically we have midfielders that are decent when they're being pressed and stuff like that. Like, you know, I've heard a lot of the fan base talk about what happened to Basuma. Like, he's not doing any of the stuff that he was doing before. That's because all of them were trying to press us off the part. You know that amazing little gif of him going through three Arsenal players and stuff like that. They're all converging on him. Newcastle aren't doing that. They're not. They're leaving him with the ball and and getting back into shape. And then he has to use his passing range, which he doesn't have. Do you know what I mean? He doesn't have a great passing range. So, so you know, short term fix. I hate to say it because I absolutely <laughs> I hate. Here we go. I, I don't hate <laughs> right there, but I. I just I don't think he's of the level at all. But short term fix, if you're facing teams like um, that are going to sit back, I think you should play Hoybier there probably because um, he's got the best passing range. Um, and I do think that what when when Basuma wasn't about, and I think Madison was out, um, our best midfield performance was that first thirty minutes against Villa, um, mm. and we had Lacelso. Um, he's not been getting a, a look in. Like he should at least be getting thirty minutes like minimum every game while Madison hasn't been doing well. So the crazy thing is we've got so many options, but I think in the summer we need to find, uh, we need to sign a specialist six um, that has a decent passing range and is more combative than um, pursue any of the others, basically, um, which is hard to find because someone that can pass and then also can, you know, you're talking about like Rodri's and stuff like that, aren't you really? So it's, it's really hard to find that type of player. But um, for now, I would definitely start giving Lo Celso more minutes. Um, and I'd, I'd try and go back to what worked. If we're facing a team that's going to press us, I'd play Basuma and um, Saar because that's what worked at the start of the season. We don't need to try and shoehorn Benton Core in there to be an eight. I think Saar is a better, better eight than... Benton Core, he's got more legs, I think. Um, and then I would just play Benton Core and Hoybier against low blocks because they've both got a best, better passing range. Um, so that's that's all I can say on that. But the, the long story short is that I don't know fully. Like We just have to go into the market, it looks like. In terms of off the ball, Josh, you took, you're mainly focusing our, 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 on our on the ball problems. But obviously, defensively, we're having a lot of issues as well. That's definitely stemming from midfield well if it's not stemming from midfield then i don't know where it's stemming from because everyone's pretty happy with the back five so what what do you think's wrong from that point of view like in the transition we keep getting we keep getting hit a lot um like who, who's is basuma a problem defensively do you think from from a midfield three as well yeah i do but i don't think we have a resolution defensively but like, i don't trust hobier is probably positionally better like he he'll stay back there for longer periods, and he'll do. But he also is just suicidal with those passes sometimes, man. And like mm. I just do not trust him. I panic so much when Vicario's like passing out to him. So, um, so he's got his problems. But Basuma has been a problem defensively. Um, I don't know what was going on. I think maybe when we were playing that high line in that first ten games, Saar did quite a good job covering him. Do you feel? Mm. Do you feel like that's that's true as well? Because um, he did used to roam forwards, but yeah, it's it's just a tough one. I don't have the answers here, but I'd I'd like to see Saar and Basuma in team in games where we're going to be pressed, like Arsenal, City, Liverpool, stuff like that. Um, and then Hoybier, Bentancourt, maybe Hoybier, Lo Celso, or Bentancourt, Lo Celso, or something. Um, We've got so many midfielders and none of them are working. It's so annoying. Well, that midfield you're talking yeah. about that did really well. That was, wasn't that, who who was in the six that day? Was it Bentancourt? Well, against Villa. Yeah, it was Bentancourt, yeah. Kulisevsky, Lo Celso. That was the midfield three, wasn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah. And we haven't seen it since. I mean, Kulisevsky, I don't know what's happening with him at the moment. We'll get into the front line in a minute. But Sim, we spoke yesterday in, in that um, clip that we did about the stats, about our midfield not being brave enough and maybe not mm. taking enough risks and maybe not in anywhere near the amount of risk that we took in those first 10 games. Do you think that's a massive factor of it? Yeah, but there could be a reason for that because of what Josh is saying. Teams are, are being a bit smarter against us. So it's a lot harder to be as brave when you're when you're not being pressed, if you know what I mean. So when teams are pressing you in the middle of the park, Basuma has that bravery and ability to turn and then run into space. And all of a sudden, once he beats a player and gets into that space, that causes a problem for the opposition because it means players are drawn to him and it creates all kinds of spaces and all kinds of problems. When they decide to not do that, they're not going to press him, they're going to stand off him. Then it's a different... Then it's a lot harder. He has to... Just, he has to actively go and decide to run at them, which is not what he's been doing before. And then if he loses the ball in that situation, we have a big, big issue. Um, and, if he, if, and he doesn't do that, then he has to, as Josh said, be a bit more penetrative with his passing, play a lot more longer, quicker passes, um, incisive, progressive passes. And that's not really Basuma's game. Uh, when, he's part, when he does pass, he's usually a lot safer. Uh, one, two, four, uh, five yard passes um, uh, near him or, or ne uh, close to him. He doesn't usually do many through balls as well. So it's very, it's difficult. You kind of want like... Um, a pace setter sometimes if teams are dropping or sitting off you and not pressing you you want someone who's willing to get the, uh, get the ball and to take the pace of a game with, with their Shouldn't ability with their Madison? passing range um no i tell you why because you want him in further forward if you if you yeah. if you've got madison in the, in that role then you've got no if whenever you get the ball forward in the, in those spaces there's no one you're giving yeah, the ball to. If you to. look at Madison's heat map, he's dropping into the number six position a lot. And that's he's a problem. dropping very deep and he's not doing those things that you're talking about when he is dropping deep. That's a we problem. Need to try, I feel like we need to try two attacking midfield, attack minded midfielders mm. when we're playing slow blocks. Like just from what you just said there, if you had Le Celso as the pace setter, helping out Basuma or ben, Benton or whatever, um, that, that could really help. But. You know, it's, it's up to Ange to come up. I'm not a tactical genius. It's up, to, it's up to Ange to find the solution. So at the end of the day, it does come down to Ange, to be honest. Mm. Kate, do you agree with that? Would you like to see maybe a Madison with a La Celso, a Madison with a Kulisevsky in the middle moving forward with the way that teams have maybe combating Spurs tactically? Um, I just think the trouble is, I know we've got loads of midfielders, but we haven't got that much quality. I mean, I don't think Basuma should be playing. I don't think he's deserved to start for the last five, six, seven games. Um, but then you, you've got to solve the conundrum of who you bring in. Hoybier, yeah, he's good sometimes when he comes off the bench, but every game he started, we've lost, which is rather concerning. Um, <laughs> I'll say, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, right, someone said to me, down. yeah, but that was the case with Bale, but I can't put Hoybier and Bale in the same sentence, I'm afraid. Um, then you've got Le Celso, who, who I just think has had that many chances at Tottenham. I'm kind of at the end of my tether with him at the minute. But again, an option off the bench. I just think we, we lack real quality in the midfield we don't have a midfield general that everyone in the premier league needs you can see the difference you know arsenal bought in declan rice and you can see the difference it's made to their team which is why i said someone like azuba mendy coming in someone that can really control it and then if you've got that sort of defensive midfielder then yeah by all means go for the two attacking midfielders in front of them but i just think although we've got a lot of options they're very weak options and uh it just feels like all of our midfielders have dropped off in form. Even like Kulu, I was always saying I wanted him in the middle, but even when he's been played in the middle, he's looked poor. You know, everyone seems to be dropping form at the same time. And I can't I can't put my finger on why it is, but um, it, it's going to be a massive summer for Spurs, massive summer for Spurs to see where we're at, where we're going and, and you know, the intentions for the team. When you're looking at just the midfield options that we have, Josh, and you're looking at the summer transfer window, who do you think needs to go and how many do we need to bring in? Um, uh, I would say that... 11. <laughs> <laughs> 11 <laughs> midfielders, yeah. <laughs> I'd say we probably... Are we being realistic here or what do I want? Because what, what, what do you I think want, we need? What do you think we need? We need minimum two. 
to come in, I think. What, a six uh, and an eight, a six and a ten. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'd say. A six and an eight or a six and a ten because um, we haven't got a proper six. It also depends who we move out because you could easily see, like, well, not easily, but, like, you, you're definitely going to see Hoybier go. You're going to see Lacelso go, yeah? Um, and then I'd be tempted, if I know this is really ruthless, but I'd be tempted to sell one of Benton Core or Basuma. Not really? Benton no. One of them, one of them, because... Yeah, I'm, because look, Benton Cole, you never know if he's going to get back to his previous, um, you know, his previous I think you level. are seeing signs of it, though. I really believe that I we're don't. seeing signs of it. Do you not? No, I haven't I haven't seen him do, you know, he's played some nice little intricate passes, like, but you've got most of the games he started, we've lost as well. I'd love to mm. see, look at the stats on that, to be honest. Um, but anyway, so I'm not like two is what will definitely go so we'll bring in two hopefully and i'd be looking at a proper six and then you either have benton court or basuma filling in when that six is injured or needs a rest or something like that um and then uh yeah another another eight but i wouldn't prioritize that the main main thing would be that like, i wouldn't be unhappy if we got one six and that was it for midfield and then we got everything we need up top and maybe a, a full back as well that can fill in for, for the others. So, to be honest, we need one of six. That's what I would say. Mm. Do you agree with that? Um, I would say, yeah, six is becoming an increasing um, necessity. I didn't believe we did need one as much as we do. But now, I'm like recently, the fact that consistently at the moment he's having to change it and uh, change things at half time change things, change things mid game because we're getting overrun or we'll keep getting hit and Basuma's not tracking his runners into the premier, into the um, penalty area and things like that um, that's definitely um, massively concerning for me I do think Basuma has the ability to do it but I think I think it's a lot of it with him is it's a mental issue I think he sometimes he doesn't lack the discipline or the control um to consistently do it and I think he has the ability I not I don't think he just showed it at Spurs I think he showed it at Brighton as well he has the ability to do it but unfortunately I don't know what it is but there, there are just some games where he just completely lose, switches off and loses concentration and I don't I, you need you need a player who's just not going to do that so definitely a number six I think I love Saar but I, th I do believe like in games, you're not going to do the dirty on Saar now, are you? No, 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 never. I think he should definitely be in, our, in in the team. But I also feel like unless he's going to be a more intricate player on the ball, uh, I feel like in certain games we need a player who's got a bit more offensive ability about them when we're playing against low blocks. I feel like when we played with Saar in midfield, unless we have space, which a lot he does really well to generate, like he doesn't um, have too many tricks up his sleeve to break down these teams or pick locks, I think, a lot of the time. Um, and then all of a sudden, we're kind of uh, relying on Madison to do something or we've got no no answer. So I would like someone next to Madison who's a bit more on his wavelength. And I don't think Saar is, to be honest. On, on Ben Tank will be that. I think Ben Tank could be that. Obviously, he was he he showed um, before he got injured. He was starting to get a few more goals, and he was starting to get in a few more in those positions. So I think I think Bentico has a bit more of that ability than Saar does. I definitely think Bentico at the moment is struggling struggling physically, especially off the ball. Um, you saw that I think in the first minute or so, he could, Gordon completely burnt him on the outside, and he couldn't get near him. And I looked at that, I thought Bentico last season that wouldn't have happened. So something yeah. so clearly he's still a bit off it off the ball. I think on the ball he's improving a bit more. I, I'm looking. I, st I see him doing a, a few things which he, he started to do last season. You know, um, those little touches past players and bursting into space and things like that. So that's coming. But yeah, at the moment he's still definitely not at the level he was last year. That's clear. But I think if he can get back to that, maybe he can be that player. But at the moment it's still up in the air. Um, I think someone like Gallagher would be a really good fit, to be honest, because I think his pressing is incredible. And I think he's starting to get a few more goals now uh, for Chelsea. I think he gets in the box really well. Um, and I think if if you're in the final third, I'd much rather have someone like Gallagher on the ball than I would Asar or Bentacle, to be honest. So I think he could be uh, a really good um, player. So I would say a, no, a more offensive number eight and a number six. Um, and depending on 
I guess even if we sell ourselves, so you could kind of have Decky as backup there. So that's probably our old looking at. It's mad. Remember, that because... we got um, we got Lucas Bergvalli, whatever he's. Yeah, yeah. Bergvalli. Bergval, yeah, he coming. could be the guy. He would definitely be the guy, to be honest, because yeah. I mean, he seems to be on Madison's way of age. Like, that's we can't a problem rely on him for next season, surely. Yeah, that's a problem. But although, not, you never but know. I don't want to. I, I don't want to block his path either. Hundred percent. You, know I mean? you look at you. But you look at players at the moment in the Champions League. Barca are playing a seventeen-year-old at centre back and a sixteen-year-old in the right wing. So Apparently the seventeen-year-old had like a man in the match performance he did. as well. And he did. So um, you can never say never. But it's interesting what you're saying with as well but because before the AFCON and I remember when he came back in for that Newcastle game and everyone realised like how much balance he gave to the team and that's what we kept saying how much balance Saar gives to this team and what a uh, asset he is and how much he's contributing week in week out I just don't think he's hit those heights con on a consistent basis since coming back from the AFCON I just think he's a player who also likes space. When there's a lot to sp when there's space in the game and teams are pressing us, he's invaluable because he covers so much of that space. Yeah. And 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 he he can, he um he's so necessary to do that and he does give us balance in those kind of games. But when teams are standing off us, it's not as necessary and all of a sudden it relies more on his technical ability and his ability on the ball in tighter spaces, um quicker passing, accurate passing, shots on goal. And that's where I'm not saying he's bad. He's still 21, and he's even at his level at the moment. He's still good, but it's not good enough at the moment in games that we're showing to be effective in us breaking teams down. And that's a bit of a problem. All right, let's move on to the next topic, and we're going to talk about Hyung Min Son. And um, you know, in the WhatsApp group, aren't we? We got Josh and David Harris going head to head on this topic all the uh -huh. time. Uh, we're going to start off with UK, and it's about whether should Son be playing on the left or as a striker, because he has struggled in the last couple of games. Um, on the left, he struggled as well a bit this season, but there was that game against Newcastle where he absolutely tore trip here, a new one. But I think the stats speak for itself that he is still an unbelievable number nine in certain games. But where do you think he should be playing, Kate? Do you know, it's so hard because, you know, Sonny's missed the Tottenham and... You know, everyone loves Sonny because, and 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 to be fair, me included, none of us want to sort of acknowledge that he's getting older and he's not going to be here forever. <laughs> no, he's not. Sonny's he's still 18. <laughs> he's he's getting, getting younger. Did exactly. You exactly. He's not getting the memo. He's getting younger. I mean, it, we, I think it's fair to say that against the low block, Sonny as a striker is, is the worst possible option because he just cannot make any sort of impression on the game at all. But when Richarlison's out, um, and I'm not saying Richarlison is the answer either, but I think Sonny plays better on the left with with a striker like Richarlison. Obviously, the, the 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 partnership he had with Harry Kane is something we'll probably never see again. Unfortunately, they knew where the other one always was. You know, they created space for one another, and I think Son's recently looking a little bit lost. I just feel the front three, no matter which three we play. I just don't think there's any communication between the three of them. When Sonny was playing with Solomon, we started to see a little bit of a partnership building up there and then Solomon got injured. And since then, I think the whole front three looks really disjointed. So I'm not sure how we resolve that. Like I say, when it's not a low block, I quite like Sonny as a striker. But when, when it's a low block team, he's got to be on the left. But again, Richarlison's been injured, so we haven't had that opportunity. But yeah. I think it's, I've, I've seen people saying we should cash on him, cash in on him now, and sell him to the Saudis um, over the past few days. I think it's bonkers. I think this fan base is so reactionary when it comes to to our players. Wait, cash in on Richarlison or Son? You're talking about Son. Son. I'm talking ah. about Sonny. Yeah. Nah. Um, you, you know, his it's stats. It's, it's, his stats show he's still a phenomenal player. It's everybody's learning where they need to be and Angie's trying to find out where people play best and it is a learning season I think everyone just needs to calm down but the front three as I say as a whole I just feel that they're not communicating very well and maybe that's because they've been chopped and changed a lot I don't know but um, personally I think Sonny would work better on the left and uh, if we had a really good striker in the middle so come the North London derby in just under two weeks time, are you starting Sonny on the left? And let's say, Rash if, let's say if Richarlison's back, are you starting Sonny on the left? Yeah, purely because I think we need Richarlison's physicality. I think we need his height and I think we need a bit of his uh, needle as well, um, winding up the, the gooners. <laughs> and like I say, if, it's, if it doesn't work, um, it can be switched. You know, Ange made changes at <coughs> half time and, 
it can be moved about. But for me personally, that is how I would start it off because I think Richie offers, like I say, I'm not a huge Richie fan, but he, he works his bits off. He's everywhere on that pitch. He's up, I'm not going to swear, he's up there defending, he's attacking, he's working hard. Plus he brings that little bit of fire to the game. He knows how to win a foul. And uh, he's got the physical presence, the height. So, yeah, personally, that is how I would start the game. But, as I say, I'm not sitting here saying that Richarlison is the answer. I'm just going with what we have available to us at the moment. Yeah, no, I get that. And I think it's spot on. Like I've been saying that uh, over the course of the season, that it's horses for courses, right? Against a low block, you probably want a Richarlison there. Against someone that plays a bit higher, Sonny running in behind is the perfect guy to have in that uh, position. But... Josh, I mean, you've been very adamant that Son should only play number nine for us uh, in the WhatsApp group. Has these last two games or last couple of games changed your mind at all? A little bit, you know. I'm a, I'm a little <laughs> bit lost with it. <laughs> a little bit lost with it. I still believe that Sonny is the best option against good teams mm. um, where we have space. Um, and I think the problems with Sonny you still get on the left wing anyway. Like, as in, the problems with him not... I, I know people say, oh, he can't bully defenders and hold up the ball or whatever, but you still want your left winger be a, to be able to hang on to the ball um, and play intricate um, football when when we're against low blocks. And he, he, he that's not his game either. He's literally running behind score, like amazing finisher, do you know what I mean? So I don't think he's going to do well that well on the left against the low block teams that we've been facing anyway um so yeah it's sad to say but i, I just think like either, my plan next season if i was in charge is i would get two new wingers yeah and have son rotating with uh a new striker that's, that's what pessy I would in do. pessy in <laughs> um and have you know sonny against teams that are going to press us um and let him get some minutes on the left wing if we need to, like whatever, he's the captain. But also, he's going to be another year older, so we need to start managing his minutes anyway. So maybe Sonny doesn't start all the time next next season. So I'd keep Sonny. I'm never saying I, I want him to sign a contract for as long as he wants and stay here forever. I love Sonny. But um, I don't think any of them are up to the task, basically. <laughs> I, would, I would sign two or three new attackers. Um, mm. Definitely. What and are you doing? If, well, well, I guess the question is for the next game, going the next few games, is Sonny going back to the left or are you playing him up front? I'd, I'd probably play him up front. I, it's funny because in the WhatsApp group I said, oh, we should bring Richie back in for Arsenal. Um, so I was on Kate's side, but then Sim kind of turned me around again and made me think, <laughs> actually, like, Sonny should get chances through the middle against Arsenal. Um and I, th I think, yeah, I, I think I'd play him through the middle. The thing is, I don't want to play Werner. <laughs> so, so, because I could just see Werner missing, like, open goals. And it's like, although Werner, although Werner um, contributes a lot, he, if he's on the pitch, he's the one that the chances are going to fall to. So I wouldn't even be opposed to. Do you remember early in the season when we were playing... Uh, Liverpool, and did we do it against Arsenal as well, where Rich Richardson was on the left? Was it? I know I we think did it against Liverpool. We did it. No, against, against Liverpool, Arsenal, didn't Richardson Brennan. come on? Brennan played on the left. Yeah, Brennan Arsenal. started and went off injured, didn't he? Yeah. And then Solomon came on. But who, and then Solomon came but, on. Yeah. But there was two games where we played Richie on the left. Yeah. Yeah. Fulham at home. Was... There was Fulham at home. Richie got two assists, I think, or one assist. He assisted Sonny in the yeah. centre. Uh, I can't remember who else. Liverpool. And his sister was Liverpool. Um, I honestly, there was a little Richie period. There was a little period, yeah. I'd play Richie on the left. and let It was uh, Crystal it Palace away working. as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so, like, if, I'd let them swap it out. If it's not working, um, and then put Sunny wide and whatever. But at least if they're on the same pitch, they can rotate and confuse and stuff like that. So mm. I'd, I'd play Richie, um, Johnson and uh, Son through the middle. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at those next three games, Arsenal, Chelsea, Liverpool. 
I mean, those are the games where you want Son down the middle. That, yeah, those are the games yeah. where we're going to have spaces for yeah. us, teams that play a high line. I mean, how many goals? Son scored two at the Emirates this season, consistently yeah. scores against Liverpool. This Chelsea side as well uh, under Pochettino, we all know how they like to play as well. So surely these next three games is going to be Son's bread and butter in the number nine, right, Sim? 100%. Um, the problem is he's in such... He's not in great form in that position. We played Newcastle away, he was terrible. Fulham away, he was terrible. West Ham away, he was terrible. So if you're a fan judging him on his previous, on his form, basically in that position, you, you I, I don't blame fans for saying, for thinking, well, he has to come out of that position. Look how he's been playing last few games. You can't take him out the number nine. He, you know, he's not, it's not working for him in the number nine. But I think if you were to take him out of the number nine with these games coming up, it would be a big mistake because, as, as you say, these are the games he's going to get the space. These are the games he thrives on. He's such a big game player. And, you know, he got two goals at the Emirates. He scored against Liverpool at the Tottenham Stadium. He always scores against City playing in the number nine. He scored at the Etihad early in the season playing in the number nine as well. Um, these are the get, and especially these teams all going for the title they're going to need the wins as well they're not going to come and sit back against Son because they need to win those games the draw's not good enough so I do think Son's going to get chances and these are the games he absolutely loves and thrives on so these are the games you need him in the number nine not just one I think we need him there I think if these teams are coming up against us and are pushing up a bit and we, and we have Richarlis in the number nine we're, they're going to be way too easy to pen us in and we're not going to have the outball of Sonny running in behind in that pace we need um, so I think for these games, we need Son in the nine. Maybe for games against Burnley, Sheffield United, um, potentially, you can put him on the left, bring Rishi in, and maybe there, there'll be more avenues for goals there. Um, I just feel like in these game, in these big, big games um, against the top three, these are games you need Sonny up front. He's a, he's a big game killer. I think he's the top goal scorer against the top five this season um, out of anyone. Um, yeah, he because, is. Five because, well. yeah, because of how effective he is in these games. Um, he, he thrives off these games. So I think it would be a mistake to go off form to move him out of that position um, yeah. going into these also, games. Also, I'm not being funny here, but like before these last three games, I think we probably all would have been in agreement saying Son is one of, if not the best number nine in the Premier League right now with the way the amount of goals he's scoring. You look at the record of games he's played number nine to assists and goals. It was just unbelievable stats. And now he's had a couple of bad performances along with a team that's had bad performances. Not just him, it's the whole team that have been performing poorly over the last couple of games. So do you not think maybe Kate or Josh, whoever wants to take this one that the fan base including us maybe have been a bit reactionary with son in the number nine yeah okay. yeah. yeah i think you're probably right i mean to be fair sonny does love to score against the gooners so you know we it's hard like i say it's hard because you do look at form and and when you see a player go off form it's one of those things do you carry on playing them into form or do you take them out the team but with sonny it's difficult he's our captain like i say he's mr spurs um, you know, I, I think this is it. this is the sort of game I believe that if Sonny's going to change his form, it, this is the sort of game he'll turn up at. He's a, you know, he's a big game player. He, he's, like I say, he's been brilliant as captain this year. So yeah, have faith in, in Sonny. I'm sure he'll turn it round. But I do think that fans, um, you know, are reactionary. We've seen it. You know, like everybody piling onto Timo. You know, it's just everyone's looking for someone to blame as to why things go wrong. And I get it, and I get it, but Sonny's got a lot of credit in the bank. So, you know, call it sentimentality or whatever you want to call it. I just think Son, you never he's the sort of player that can come on, come on or start a game and change a game instantly. You know, he's going to set the pace and set the tone. And, uh, yeah, so I do think we can be a bit reactionary. I'm not not going to lie. And I'm guilty of it as well. And also, it's probably <laughs> bit, there's so much more pressure on, on Son than maybe other attackers at other clubs. Like, Son is just so far and away our, like, biggest goal or uh, goal uh, output um, in the forward line. It's like when he has an off day, everyone focuses on him. Like, if he's having an off day, it's not working for him, then that's a big problem. Like Harlan's had a few off days recently, but no one really talks about it, do they? Because they've got people like Foden scoring hat tricks. They've got other players filling in. It feels like with Sonny, if he's not getting in the score sheet, then we struggle to score. And that's that's a big. That's not a problem with Sonny. That's a problem with us as and a club. Straight away, the narrative is, oh, he's not good enough for number nine anymore. I was like, and then he, on the left, it'll be the same. Like if he has a bad performance in the left, oh, he's not a left winger no more. Put him at number nine. Yeah. Like he is literally the best left winger and the best number nine at his club. And I think he's good at both roles. Um, the but I just, is, I just prefer him in the number nine. 
We've gone from being Harry Kane FC to Son FC now because we're completely reliant on Son to score our goals. So, yeah. you know, we, we've kind of just moved the responsibility across. Yeah, it's so true. Um, but look, we'll see what happens. Let's hope he does. I, I back him to get back to full form in these next three games um, where he can really find that space in behind. But let's talk about that Champions League blow uh, as the last topic of the panel today. And uh, seeing as the, the question is, have we blown Champions League? And I think it's only right to go to Lord Pessy himself uh, for this one first. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been thinking for a while that we weren't going to get it. Me and Sim have been... <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think, like, I did a, a WhatsApp, uh, the WhatsApp search, like, um, on the group chat about Villa or something like that. And I was literally saying in October to Sim, we're not finishing above Villa. <laughs> but that was just, um, me being a pessimist. I think now looking at it, um, we're a very similar level to Villa, but I feel like Villa have slightly better games and they've got one of their hard games out the way where they've won it. Um, so I now think that it, I, I give us around a 20, 30% chance. I think we, the, the games that we actually blew it in were Fulham and uh, Wolves. W w those, those two games really got to me and maybe the draw against West Ham. We've had so many chances that I just... Well, the Villa home game as well. We should have been home and hosed in the first 20 minutes. Exactly. So it's like, well, th that's the thing that I'm, I'm hopeful about for next season. There's so many results where I know we've taken a few pastings as well that we didn't expect. But there's so many results where it could have easily gone the other way and we could have those couple of extra points here, here and there. Um, but yeah, I think for me, I'm quite sure that Villa will finish above us. Um, and that's why I'm so interested in what goes on with the um, Champions League and who, who gets knocked out. And that's what I was saying this morning about uh, the point systems and all that sort of stuff. So for me, I think we'll finish fifth. Um <coughs> And it, we do need to get some points from these games to even guarantee that, to be honest. You reckon? How many points do you think we need from now to the end of the season just to guarantee fifth? We're 10 points ahead. I six think. will be enough. The Burnley and Sheffield United will be enough for that. Yeah, six I think so. Be, six should be enough, yeah. So what, you don't think we'll get that? No, I'm just saying like... <laughs> I, I I'm, just, I'm just saying like... I'm, I can't guarantee that we're going to beat... Burnley and Sheffield. Like, I can't guarantee that like, because they're both low block teams or they, they'll probably both play low block against us anyway. Yeah, They'll both so, be down hopefully by then, you'd think. We went to Turf Moor and stuck five past them earlier in the season. Yeah, and we, you know, we've had seasons where we thought we were good and we got um, lose 5-1 to relegated teams and stuff like that. Like Newcastle, do you remember that against Newcastle? So all I'm saying is... You it's can't not... compare Rafa Benitez Newcastle to these Sheffield United, surely. We went down last game of the season under Conte and beat Norwich 5-1 or whatever it was. 5-0, yeah. Five yes, nil. but that, that was when it was in our hands. So, like, if we if it gets to the point where, like, um, you know, we have uh, six points, that we have to get six points to get Champions League in those, mm. those two games or something, then I, I might think, oh, OK, like, yeah, we'll go for it. But if it's just we're battling for fifth, yeah, and fifth is Europa League, we might get to those games and just feel a bit lethargic and we might draw one. And if we draw mm. one and we haven't won any of those other games, then we don't get the six points. It's not out of the realms of possibility that we end up with less than six points like because we've got such hard games that we don't historically win, apart from Arsenal at home, which we lost last season. So, you know, it's it's tough. It's tough right now. I know I'm pessimistic, but... I can't guarantee that we're going to get six points. Josh, uh, I want a, I want a prediction. Six games to go. We're on sixty points. What, what's our points total at the end of the one. season? <laughs> <laughs> what, what are we ending um, on? What are we ending on? Uh, he he can't six. go six because we're definitely getting something in the North London derby. <laughs> <laughs> well, are we? That's what I'm saying. We lost last season, but anyway, so. Um, I'd say the first number that came to my head was 69. <laughs> 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 what I mean is that Pause. Three wins, three wins, but we might get a draw in there as well. And one of those might be a draw. So I don't think we're going to, if we're on 60 points, um, I think 70 would be a big ask. 70 would be a big ask. So you think okay. six, You think it will be 69 then? 68, Shrek 69, yeah. 68. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, and that probably... 
I mean, after Villa beating Arsenal, probably won't be enough. But you never know. Villa, Villa's all. I don't. Villa don't have any easy games though. Like apart what from they, they don't. Who have, they got. They got. They were coupled with Europe as well. Uh, Bournemouth yeah. at home, who are on good form. Uh, Chelsea at home, unbe- who are unbeaten. Brighton away. Liverpool at home, and Palace away at the end of the season. Wow, so none of, I didn't know that was their running. That's so none tough. of them are easy. None of them are easy. No, none of them are like guaranteed wins. And let's be real, yeah. This Villa result against Arsenal threw a massive curveball at us because they were not on good form by any stretch of the imagination before that. I think they had, what, one win in their last five games and we battered them 4-0 at Villa they Park. they just given a two-goal lead away at Brentford, home to Brentford. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. this Villa result and performance at the Emirates came out of nowhere. And I think, yeah. look, they played very well. But there's nothing to say with European football as well. Hopefully they'll get to the Conference League final. Like there's nothing to say that they're going to go on a good run now. We're going to need them to win the Conference League if we want fifth to be Champions League. I know. By the way, I know exactly what's going to happen. I think I've said this Can't. before. Yeah. I just know that what's going to happen is we're going to go into that last week of of the Premier League and have to either beat. Uh, um, Man City to guarantee top four for us, like because Villa have been on funny form. Like if we beat Man uh, Man City, we guarantee top four. But if we beat them as well, we guarantee Arsenal getting the title. Like as in, I can see that that double jeopardy happening where we have to decide whether we want Champions League or we want Arsenal to win the. And there is only one just... winner in that, my friend. There is only one winner, and that is get that title away from the yeah. Emirates. I am telling you, I care a lot more about Arsenal not winning the league than Spurs going and getting top four. One hundred percent. I agree. I agree. Um, but Kate, where are you at with it? Do you think we've thrown it away now? Um, we've still got a game in hand, have we not? We yeah. do. Chelsea away. We do. Yeah, which I think we we can beat them. Um, all you got to do is keep Palmer quiet. And then so it's only know. the it's only the one win in thirty years. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all hoodoos have got to be broken, here, right? And uh, I think if you can keep Cole Palmer quiet, then you're you're safe as houses because they are officially Palmer FC. But um, no, look, it is still in our hands. There's a lot to, of football still to play. I know it's a cliche. It's the same as the title race. Everyone's saying that's over. I don't think Man City will go to the end of the season without dropping points either. Yeah. Um, I think we will probably, out of the last six games, I think we'll end up with about 70, 71 points. That's what I'm, I'm predicting. Will that be enough? Will that be enough to overcome Villa, do you think? Um, I actually predicted Villa to finish above us in October and I actually said it on wow. stream and I got a lot of abuse, but I said I think they're attacking and they're wingers. And, you and two should speak good. more often. <laughs> I know, we really should. Um, uh, because I just think that they're attacking and, and midfielders are, are better than ours. Yeah. But um, will it be enough? If it's meant to be, it will be. Yeah, I'll look, let me sit on the fence and say, if, it's, if we're meant to get Champions League, we'll get it. <laughs> it's as easy as that. I'm like Do you, Ben. All I want is for us to to stop Arsenal winning the league, and that's sad. But it's just, I mean, we're going to the North London derby, like I told you. I can't wait. And yeah, the thought of just stopping them and smashing their season to bits it just makes me so happy. It'll be, it'll make me so much more proud if we, if we just, if we lose every other game from now to the end of the season, but but beat Arsenal and stop them winning the league, I'll take that. I really would exactly. take that. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Sim, what are you thinking? Um, do I think, obviously, yeah, it's been a detrimental week for our hopes of getting Champions League for sure. I think Opta, I said this before, Opta um, on the uh, predictor before the weekend had Villa at 35% chance of finishing in the top four. And after the weekend, it's now 70%. So that's how much of a swing it's been uh, just one weekend with our result against Newcastle, their result against um, Arsenal. Um, Obviously, brilliant result against Arsenal. Um, I do feel like Villa, though, after after European games, I know they had a European game before the Arsenal game, but I, I feel like... Villa do struggle a lot after these European games and they're still very reliant on um, kind of... Uh, obviously, obviously, Ollie Watkins um, getting on the score sheet. Um, they're, they're still quite... They don't have... Um, 
great control over games I see which is why they lose a lot of leads I think they score they're good at scoring goals but they're not good at protecting leads and they do give up goals I wouldn't be surprised if on the weekend they do like to say drop points to Bournemouth who are on very good form and they do struggle in other games but obviously we got the hardest one impossible the top three um, but we are unbeaten against the top three this season. We haven't lost to them yet. Mm. So I think there is something to say about that as well. And we've also got the bottom, two of the bottom three to play in Burnley and Sheffield United. So I do think that there are six points there for sure, at least. And then I do think where there is going to be, though I, I, I'm predicting four points from those other four games. So I think we'll definitely get six points out of Burnley and Sheffield, in my opinion. And then can, I think if we can get four points out of um, Arsenal, City, Liverpool and Chelsea, I don't know if four will be enough. Maybe we need, maybe we would need four. Would, if we get four points out of that, that puts, puts us on 70. That's not terrible, but do, will, will Villa get seven or more points out of... Um, out of Bournemouth, Chelsea, Brighton, Liverpool and Palace. Do I see seven points there for Villa? I think, let's say Bournemouth, they can get a win there. So let's say they beat Bournemouth on the weekend. That's three. I see them struggling They to Chelsea because they lost to Chelsea in the cup and Chelsea did a real big job on them. So I see drop points there. I see drop points away at Brighton as well. I, I also see potential drop points at home to Liverpool, depending if they're in the title race or not. So I reckon there I is a chance they won't get seven. There is a chance. I think, beat, I think they beat Brighton comfortably, man. Away they, from home? Brighton have only lost yeah. twice at home this season. Yeah, but Brighton haven't really got much to play for, especially at that stage. Like, And I just think... They're, Emery, they're still in it with Europe at the moment. I don't think they win it comfortably. They might are win they it. Playing, are they playing Bournemouth home or away? Bournemouth at home. So there's a good chance they win that. And then yeah. they end the season away at Palace where Glasner, who's doing all right at the moment that'll be a difficult game none of those villa games are give me games like you would probably no. assume the sheffield united and burnley ones are for us i don't think villa yeah. have any guaranteed points yeah it's true it's i'm tough. predicting I, I could i could see like them being getting less than seven but they just beat arsenal so maybe they'll get more points than i expect and maybe they'll go on a big run now so it's tough to call. It is very, very close. I'm, I think I have it very, very close. But I think if we can get to 70, I think there's a good chance we get it. You do got to remember, though, they're going to have Europa Conference League semi-final um, exactly. and in, in, in the midst yeah. of that. So it's not like it's group stage game where they can rest a few players. They're going to have to go full mm -hmm. pelt in those games. And also they might have hard, like it won't just be, uh, I don't think it will just be uh, taxing physically in terms of will they have players to play both games, like getting tired. I think mentally, will players have half an eye on it? Will Una Emre who's very historically always concentrated on Europe will he have half an hour on those games um, if someone's you know struggling with fitness and in the race for the top four will he prioritise the conference league game for those kind of uh, players so I think that all could definitely play into it and I can see Villa struggling um, at, the, at the end of the season um, but in terms of will can fifth still be um, a Champions League spot um, I think there's still a good chance again another week where <laughs> it, went, it went from 75% before last week and now it's about 57% I think with Opta with, with fifth place being a Champions League spot I think the the key takeaway here is um, even if Liverpool West Ham and Arsenal all go out this week there is actually still a good chance that fifth will still be Champions League even on that basis so given that I would say there's still a good chance fifth will be Champions League um, but I think I think even if Leverkusen win the Europa League and then and City and Villa win conference and Champions League then fifth still is um, going to be a Champions League space so I would still say I'm leaning towards fifth place will be but um, also we need Liverpool even if they go out to, uh, this week we need them to win the second leg and if they go out we need um, if West Ham can avoid defeat that will help even if they go out to Leverkusen and we need obviously City to beat Madrid if City go out to Madrid we're in big trouble if City and, yeah. and mm. And, and um, athletic, if Atletico beat Dortmund. And if, Dortmund, yeah, if Dortmund night. somehow overcome, if Dortmund overcome What's Atletico, we're in big trouble. 2 1. 2 1. 2 1 to uh, Atletico. Atletico should have won that more comfortably, but they didn't. Um, so if they if Dortmund somehow pull off a shock, we're in so trouble. So who did Germany well. have left? It's just Leverkusen and Munich and, and Dortmund. Dortmund. Those, Those are three. the three teams left. So hopefully Dortmund yeah. go out, but there's a good chance Bayern and Leverkusen both. Was there an three. outside chance for Spain as well to get into the top two? 
Oh, not looking good for them, I don't no. think. No. Well, even know. if Real Madrid... Uh, and Barca. Barca. Real Madrid... Let's say Real Madrid Atletico final in the Champions League. I don't know how far behind they are. I have to see the... Tw- I don't know how far it's so classic Spurs really... though isn't it like we we're like <laughs> Arsenal by Munich in the quarterfinals and like if if Arsenal win that guarantees pretty much that you know what you know what you know what's going to happen we're going to Villa will pip us to fourth and then we're going to need them to win the conference league to get us fifth place Champions League they'll lose the final now, that'll probably that's probably that's probably what's going to happen that'll be that would be typical Spurs that yeah. would be I've never been more stressed out as a Spurs fan than watching that Chelsea Champions League final with oh, them needing man. to lose I, I can't have a repeat of that I can't have a repeat of that it's um, so classic like we're trying to rely on our two of our biggest rivals West Ham and Arsenal to progress in Europe uh, for Spurs to get fifth in the uh, in the Spain, table Champions League but look yeah Spain are quite far behind oh, is it quite far yeah they're quite far yeah how many points is it doesn't sound like a lot but it's 1. 1. 1.7 1.72 so that's quite a lot but considering you get like 0. 0.2 for a win and stuff mm. like that so they're 1.7 so they're quite a far behind so they'll probably they would need all the English teams to crash out of this round essentially for them to have a chance well it's not be all, beyond all realms of possibility yeah that could happen well, apart but from it, Villa but if all, if all like yeah but if all English clubs crash out of this round then when we're losing we're to done, Germany yeah, yeah. What, be honest with yourselves though yeah forgetting the money oh actually you can't really forget the money but like <laughs> do, is there a part of you that kind of wouldn't mind Europa League considering 100%. where we are in the squads and stuff 100% like I I see so much value of being in the Europa League next season. First of all, I think it's more where our level's at at the moment. And yeah. second of all, you see a lot of players, like you're looking at the Devines, the Donleys, the Bergvals, yeah. all these kind of players. They're going to get a real chance in that competition, particularly in the group stages. So yeah. I, I see a lot of value of being Europa League next season. And this is why, this is the first time ever, I think, in a top four race that Spurs have been involved in that I'm not really asked about it. Like, I'm not asked if we get a top four or five. Like, obviously, I want us to finish as high as possible and I'd prefer us to be in the Champions League. But realistically, I'm, I'm not really that asked about it. People forget there probably wouldn't be a Harry Kane if there wasn't, if we weren't in the Europa League last season. <laughs> the if, Europa if League we Messi. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, you're right. You wouldn't have got a look in. But then, with the, but then again, we went to we played in the Conference League, and I remember everyone was saying that season, "Oh, we're going to play the kids," and the kids didn't get a look in in that competition. So, we have to, and Europa League is quite a decent standard these days, especially with the new format. Potentially, I don't know what that means if the standards going up. So, I don't know if you can afford to play the kids and get through. I don't know. Oh, do you know what? I'd love to go Champions League actually because it's the new format next season, isn't it? Yeah, it's the so new format you next get year. To be the first one. I'd, I'd like. I'd like that. Can I just and you say don't, massive, go on, Kate. Go no, on, I was Kate. just going to say massive big up to our Spurs ladies for getting through to the final. Yeah, yeah absolutely, fun. absolutely. I'm going to try you know, get to Wembley for that. Do you know what? I went on. I went on the site and they were saying they're sold out already, but apparently really? there are being another load released to the clubs. Yeah, uh, twelve thousand each out. apparently. Yeah, yeah, but because we we're going to try and go as well because I think it'll be amazing. But yeah, nice to see the ladies doing what the men can't do. As yeah. usual. Maybe, maybe they'll win some silverware for the men's team. Let's hope. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so. Let's who they're playing so. in the final? United. Man United. Man yeah. United. And who's yeah. who's, who's is Manu a favourite? Yeah, big favourite. Manu lost in the FA Cup final last year to Chelsea, and then they beat them just now in the semis. How are they doing in the end in the league then? Because they had a great start, didn't I think they? The all fifth ladies, or something, but... fifth, fifth okay. or sixth or something. Yeah, it was a great. We're watching it here. the The end of the game was a brilliant game. Uh, you no, know, fully deserved it. And uh, yeah, let's hope they can bring the trophy home. And that, that's I think a good way to end the show. Probably absolutely a nice positive note after all that pessiness during uh, <laughs> an hour and a half. But uh, no, thank you, thank you guys for coming and joining us today on the panel. Thank you everyone in the chat as well. Uh, Kate, do you want to let the people know where they can find you and uh, what kind of content's coming out on your platform? Yeah, just to go with Love Spurs. Um, me and my husband are always on there. We have Ellie, who used to actually play for the Spurs ladies. She's a big part of the channel. Uh, we do all sorts. We do Premier League predictions, uh, previews. Uh, we've got Mickey Hazard coming up in a few weeks oh, to do lovely. his end of season wow. um, review. Uh, we've got some other names. Gary Mabbott's another one who's booked to come on the channel, just waiting for a final date. So, yeah, we, we do all sorts on there. We cover the top six and... <laughs> Yeah, we try to keep it balanced. We try to keep it fun. 
because you know being a Tottenham fan isn't fun but we always try and put some sort of positive spin on it somewhere <laughs> along the line so yeah come over it's uh everyone's welcome we've got rivals in there as well so we get all the banter it's, it's just a nice place to be big up to everyone go and subscribe to just a girl who loves spurs and josh anything you want to plug i know you don't have a channel or anything but you can just plug the pessy nature of uh, um. just the world at <laughs> the moment yeah if you want to you know see me in action being pessimistic um check out at josh king Coys on twitter i'm sure you'll find some pessimistic stuff not just spurs but it could be about movies just you know whatever or get or get an invite <laughs> to the it. invite to the whatsapp group and then you can see all the pessiness <laughs> in its full glory uh but no thank you guys uh again uh for coming on today we'll see you all very soon let us know your thoughts in the comment section below like subscribe and comment and as always come, come on, on you spurs, spurs.